I don't see any remarkable difference between the Nam de Kano of the old and the Nam de Kano of 21st October. The only thing I discerned, I could see, was that he has uh, lost a lot of weight. I think everybody noticed that. So I do believe that uh, the loss of weight has um, a whole lot to do with the conditions of his detention in Nigeria, uh, which is uh, very uh, restrictive and uncomfortable and very degrading. And I think also it's indicative of what he passed through in Kenya when he was renditioned there in late June 2021. So apart from the weight loss, nothing again when you see? Uh, before his rendition, Namdi Khan was receiving treatment for a heart condition called heart murmur. And, um, you know, of course, he has a, 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 an extreme form of uh, hypertension. Uh, his medical uh, report uh, is a matter for public uh, consumption through the facility of the processes we filed in that regard. He was receiving treatment in Texas. United States back in February this year for that. And when he entered Kenya sometime in May, he also made contact with a, a hospital in Kenya to treat these conditions. And these conditions persist. And our thesis, our position is that the DSA's facility is, uh, a, you know, a, a poster uh, ex exemplar of what uh, detention facilities in Nigeria are like in terms of uh, inadequacy of medical facilities. I don't believe that DSS facility has the, the competence or the medical competence to take care of his uh, medical condition, which we consider life-threatening. Okay, and now we don't finish for your appearance. Uh, many Nigerians want to know what happened inside the courts during the, the trial. Even then, um, doctor people, journalists, we're supposed to bring that information. They know allow some of them enter inside the court. So you think tell us what happened for inside the courtroom before and after Imam Bukhano did not get it? What happened uh, uh, was that, you know, it took a little while before they brought him inside. So when they brought, they brought him inside, it wasn't in chains. If you recall on 29 June 2021, when they presented him uh, subsequent to the rendition, uh, he was in chains. He was in manacles, and that's unconstitutional. You shouldn't be doing that to suspects. Nigerian constitution says you shouldn't. The Supreme Court of Nigeria said you shouldn't. So they, uh, well, anyway, on 21st October, they didn't. So he wasn't in manacles, he wasn't in handcuffs. So um, he walked freely uh, inside the confines of the courtroom and, you know, he received salutations from his counsel and um, gathered other people who were in the court and uh, we had opportunity to have to have photo opportunities with him. We snapped pictures with him and uh, uh, it was a more relaxed atmosphere from what it was uh, the last time he wasn't presented in court. It wasn't raucous, it wasn't noisy. And only few people were, of course, allowed inside the courtroom. And I believe um, that had more to do with the COVID protocols. Of course, you know, uh, the, the prosecution made a presentment of the amended charges. Uh, if you recall, they had amended these charges a few days uh, to the hearing. And again, they did uh, another amendment, which I considered more of sui sponte on the spot. And uh, of course, there was no opportunity that the defense um, has. I don't think uh, we were given sufficient opportunity to go home and study these charges to see how our client would respond to them. But again, the judge, wanted a plea to be taken and that's exactly what happened so a plea was taken and i don't think that has prejudiced the uh, challenges the constitutional challenges we have to these charges which will come up on the 10th of november okay uh, on friday the attorney general of the federation uh, the minister of defense to uh, abuba kamalami he hold press conference on friday and need to have been there he read them uh, plenty things uh, where Nam the Kano and the IPO do uh, some of the things when talk. He say in some appeals for Nam the Kano, say instigate violent attacks for democratic institutions like correctional centers, police stations, INEC offices, and others between October 2020 
and June 2021. As uh, Malami talked this thing on Friday, you don't tell your client, Nandi Kanu, about this uh, repair development. You have asked me this question now about the press conference that was uh, done by the Attorney General on Friday. Um, it's quite surprising that uh, a day after uh, these hearings, I think it was a day after or two days after, the Attorney General saw the occasion to address a press conference um, you know, that uh, is diametrically removed from what um, happened in court. Uh, you see, uh, it, 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 it should, Attorney General should be reminded that, uh, he, you know, despite his duality of role on the Nigerian constitution, he's also the Attorney General of everybody. Uh, his job is not regime protection. His, re his job is to uphold the law and see that justice is done to every Nigerian citizen, and even foreigners who happen to find themselves in Nigeria. What he appears to be saying on Friday is akin to saying that the witch cried at night and the baby died in the morning. Therefore, the witch killed the baby. You see, he read off all these allegations without substance. Um, he never presented any, any evidence. And we have this particular one concerning the NSAS uh, protest. We had commissions of inquiry across the country, particularly in Lagos, and I think they had one in Imo State as well, uh, that I know personally about. And there was no, uh, nothing from any of these commissions of inquiry that returned an indictment of Mazin Namdekan or IPOB in the aftermaths of uh, the NSAS protest. So that accusation was made in bad faith and uh, it's intended to poison the minds of the public and also to prejudice the mind of the court as well. It's a highly prejudicial uh, interview and uh, we are studying the contents to see whether uh, there is going to be any legal reactions that should come from our side. Okay, we never finish with the accusation where Marami uh, not for He also told say on 21st October 2020, uh, your clients do online calling radio program for when you use a radio biafra to instigate ICOP members and answer. Wait, wait, members. listen, I understand the question. Um, you see, this matter is subjudice. I want to break it down. No, I can't allow us to go into an excursion of what is before a competent court of law in Nigeria. If the Attorney General doesn't want to keep the rules of subjudice, this is a matter before the court. If he has any evidence that our client was caught up in any wrongdoing or criminality, he should uh, know better than anybody else that the proper forum for presentation of that evidence is a court of law, not calling press conferences. So if the Attorney General is preempting the Nigerian judiciary, if the Attorney General is disrespecting the Federal High Court, I will not play that game and stay here and disrespect the Federal High Court. I will wait for him to come before the court with any evidence that he claims to possess so we can meet him in court toe to toe. If there was any radio program, um, a respect, respected uh, uh, medium like BBC could have been aware of it more than my humble self. So if the Attorney General monitored any radio program, I think there was something about a radio program that was monitored in Enugu, not in Abuja. And you begin to wonder what is Mazin Namdekan doing facing a federal high court in Abuja. He should be facing a federal high court in Enugu. So there are just so many issues here bordering on uh, prosecutorial misconducts of the extreme degree. And these things will be ventilated better in, within the, uh, the confines of where we have the privilege of ventilating these things, which is the courtroom. I should not be seen to be subjecting or succumbing to these antics by the Attorney General of subjecting Mazin Namdekano to a media trial. In, you, you said the press conference was on Friday. Today is Saturday. So I'm telling you we are studying the contents of the press conference to see whether it is necessary for us as lawyers to join issues with him in the, med in the media or to wait for him in open court. Well, that brings me to the constitutional action 
that I brought on behalf of Mazin Nandekano before the High Court of Abia State. That action, as you all know, is called Fundamental Rights Action. And same Attorney General has filed an application before the High Court of Abia State uh, requesting for extension of time to respond. So why did he now turn around, instead of responding to the suit that I filed in Abia State, or filing whatever he has before the High Court in Abuja. Now he turns around to come before the media to be spewing out, spewing out all these uh, accusations that uh, lack substance and uh, material evidence. So that is the question. Uh, the question, uh, again, I'll repeat, is if the Attorney General has something that he believes to be cogent and material, he has a forum where he should present those things. And that forum is not before the Nigerian public, but before the courts of the land, um, which are now considering the various processes that uh, are ongoing before them. You were responding to uh, the accusation by the Federal of the Federation, uh, where he talks, say, uh, Nandikanu provoke IPOP members and the uh, ESM members to carry out the killings of uh, APC uh, chieftain Ahmed Bula and uh, the husband to um, late uh, Gigi of Nata, Dora Akunili, Mr. Chike Akunili, say now he now instigates IPOP and ESM members to carry out those things. Well, regarding these accusations by the Attorney General that Mazen Nandekano instigated a certain killings, including that of Dr. Akunili, and the APC chieftain and the others, the unrest that we have in Anambra State at, the, at this point in time, that's, that's what I think he's referring to. Uh, I'm here to tell you that we have charges in open court. The Attorney General have filed charges that don't contain these allegations. So I think the best place to address these allegations, or if he has any evidence, is the courtroom before the Federal High Court coming to the Nigerian public to begin to adduce new allegations that are different from what um, is before the court, I think is improper. Now maybe talk about uh, what is concerning this and uh, the Anambra elections. The elections will happen um, November 6th. So what do you think about um, the democratic dispensation of your clients? as it relates to the November 6th uh, election for Anambra State? Well, you see, there are more important issues in Nigeria than elections. Well, elections can come and go, but those issues will remain. The issues are clear, that a lot of people who are Nigerians are no longer happy being Nigerians. It doesn't make them unpatriotic. It doesn't make them criminal. One of the ways citizens express their unhappiness with the system or with how their country is going is by engaging in agitations. And my clients happen to be engaged in agitation. And that agitation is informed by their right to save determination, which is not a crime. I don't think criminalizing the demand of a people, of millions of people, you see, I, this is beyond IPOB. The restiveness in this country is also rampant in the western part of the country. And parts of the north are also restive. I'm not talking about the terrorists in the north, but civil restiveness. So it indicates an overall unhappiness that is coming from vast majority of Nigerians with the way things are, with the way the system is structured. And that is something that does not deserve a bullet. It does not deserve prosecution, which is now turning to be a persecution, what he deserves is but this dialogue, civil engagement, constructive engagement. That's the only way you get to the position where everybody will be comfortable with an arrangement for a new Nigeria that would ensure equity and social justice for all. If somebody is saying, I want out, I don't want to be a Nigerian anymore, he's not committing any crime. And that is why you see this slew of nations around the world being very understanding of the matter and offering political asylum to members of IPOB. Number one is Britain. You see, if what IPOB is doing is illegal, is criminal, why would a major power 
like United Kingdom, consider that IPOB members are entitled to asylum in UK. You see, the, 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 the basic requirement for asylum all over the world is guided by this. Anybody that possesses a well-founded fear of persecution simply because he possesses, you know, he subscribes to a political opinion the government of the day is wishing to suppress by means of punishment of some sort. That qualifies you for protection, for refugee status, for asylum status. IPOB members have been found across the world as people, as a people that possess a legitimate political opinion, which is self-determination, that the government of the day is wishing to suppress by means of punishment of some sort. That is what we are dealing here. It's bigger than any election. And anybody that is asking you for a referendum is conducting himself within the framework of the law. He's not asking for war. You shouldn't face him with war. Referendum is a civil demand, and it had produced very good results in the past. Within the Federation of Nigeria itself, it was a referendum that created the fourth region of Midwest. And outside of it, it was a referendum that they took western part of Cameroon from Nigeria and gave it to Cameroon, and took the former Sadarana province of Cameroon and gave it to Nigeria, the present day Adamawa and parts of Taraba states. So what we are talking about here is not a situation that requires the government to prioritize the levying of violence against the people that are not violent. Okay, um, now the election matters um, will they talk about. Um, my next question is say, um, your client, Nambi Karu, you know whether he don't give uh, any order, say, making members no vote for the upcoming election for Anambra State. Uh, you know whether he don't talk, say, no election will vote for. Southeastern region. I can tell you on good authority that what concerns Nam Dekano at this point in time is this question. The question is that the prosecutor, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, has lost her jurisdiction, her authority to try him in court because of the extraordinary rendition. This is what he's confronting right now. Nothing compares at all. That is the most important task at hand, that someone would be subjected to such flagrant violation of international law and the municipal laws of Kenya and Nigeria, and then you think you can subject that person to trial? No, you can't. This is what concerns my client and the at this point, and that's what we are dealing with. So, what did the trial to say the Anambra State election will consign them at this time? What I'm trying to say is that the matter of the moment that the Nigerian public should concern itself about is what happened to him. If it's not important, I don't see why a very strong, advanced, powerful nation like United States should be filing something in Nigeria requesting for extradition of Abakiari to United States to answer to some criminal allegations. If that's not important, all they needed to have done is to come to Nigeria and rendition him by force. So this is a very important subject that I think Nigerian public should advert its minds to. And the second one I want to point to is the, uh, what I have seen as the reluctance of the British government to exact her diplomatic influence over this matter. Amna Nekano is a dual citizen. At the, at the very best, he's a dual citizen. At the very worst, he had publicly renounced his Nigerian citizenship. But let us assume, for purposes of this conversation, that he's a dual citizen of Nigeria and Britain. That does not justify Nigeria renditioning him in this way. Britain wouldn't have renditioned him as well. Britain has a public policy against extraordinary rendition that dates back to 1984 when Nigeria attempted to rendition Omar Odeko. It didn't succeed. 
but it drew countervailing and strong diplomatic responses from Britain. Britain cut diplomatic relations with Nigeria for two years. They arrested 17 persons, convicted four, who served between six to eight years imprisonment in the UK, and they were subsequently uh, deported. And the Nigerian aircraft that was going to be the vessel for the rendition you know, was interdicted in Britain. So that sort of response is what we expect could have occurred in this situation of Nam de Kano. Whether it's going to occur, I don't know. I don't know what they are doing, you know, covertly or otherwise. But we haven't seen any strong actions by the uh, British government towards the direction of protecting their, the rights of their citizen mass in Nam de Kano. The allegation still they say uh, the sponsors of Namikano and IPOM, and uh, then some day Nigeria, some day abroad. How you will take react to this story, this story where they fly up and down? Well, you know, talking about sponsors, I think all sponsors should be named. They should start by naming the sponsors of Boko Haram from even before the present government came to power. The sponsors of, of Boko Haram were well known to government. They said it themselves, even recently, that they know the sponsors of Boko Haram. Why are they not naming them? So let us uh, uh, have a situation where you name sponsors of everything. You don't just make a wide allegation of, of sponsors without naming names. Name names. You get people where their business don't scatter, and they don't lose money because of uh, all the katakata where they happen for Southeast region and even Nigeria at large. Uh, your client, you, know, you, get to tell this you see, uh, this, what is going on here, uh, which I don't want the media to be hoodwinked into playing a part, is this trial by Odile. Nam the Kano here, Nam the Kano there. What about a swap? Islamic state in West African Peninsula that now possesses a weapon that threatens civil aviation in this country. There have been media reports recently, credible media reports, that Nigerian security or Nigerian government had to pay certain humongous amount of money to retrieve a projectile or some kind of a missile possessed by uh, the terrorists that could down any civil aircraft in this country, including that of the president. And we're here thinking in Nam de Kano is the problem of this country, in Nam de Kano is the solution. To the problems of this country. I can tell you that, that on good authority. Anybody that listens to him very well and keeps an open mind will be seeing him spewing solutions, not problems. The problems of this country are bigger than what we are talking about. So making him the poster boy for all the problems of the country is the most unfortunate thing that has happened in recent times. It is, it is trial by ordeal. If you want to solve the problem of this country, you start from the head. The fish rots from the head, and we know where the head of this country lies. Then when you get past that, you go to the real terrorists, Boko Haram, Eswap, the militants, which the entire world have gathered together and declared the terrorists. How can Nigeria be isolated in her declaration of IPOB as a terrorist organization, and no single nation in the world has fallen in line to do the same thing. It's a very, very um, topical question that should be put out there. People should think about it. Instead, countries all over the world are doing the opposite. They are saying IPOB is not a terrorist organization. That means Mazin Namdekano is not a terrorist. So this prioritization of Mazin Nam de Kano as a singular problem this nation is facing is one of the pointers to what is structurally wrong with this country, Nigeria, of the present era. It is wrong. It shouldn't happen. So if you be Nam de Kano in no day here, but we see you now as Nam de Kano mouthpiece, uh, what thing you will tell Nigerians we don't suffer one loss or the other? How you will take comfort then? where the comfort is given to Nigerians is very simple. Tell your government to listen to voice of reason. That's how he puts it. 
and that voice of reason is to conduct a referendum. That's what he's been saying all along, nothing else. And that very position he has taken, has taken root, not only in Igbo land, in Southeast. He has supporters, millions of supporters across South South. And he's also garnering supporters in middle Nigeria, and even up in the north. Namde Kano is the voice of the downtrodden. Anybody, in fact, he represents, you know, the voice of justice. So if you listen to him and, as a government and keep an open mind, what he is saying really is not something that should threaten the state. It's something that, in the end, will benefit everybody. So it's not something you levy a war of attrition against, whether it's a judicial or prosecutorial war or military war. It's something that you call him to the table and engage him constructively and ask him questions. How do we get to saying yes? He's not a lone voice in the wilderness. He represents the voice of millions of people that cross, that cuts across Nigeria. Nnamdi Kanu did for DSS and in trial they go on. Yet everything still they go on as usual. Which people where they support Nnamdi Kanu for Nigeria? Yeah, they did. It's very business when they do. When we say even as if they for DSS and things still they go on. It's very good question. If by everything that is going on, you mean the several sit at home, the overwhelming success of the several sit at home. If that's what you mean by everything that has been going on while he's being detained, that underscores that he's in charge. That underscores his popularity. That underscores his influence and reach. And that underscores the legitimacy of what he demands. He's in incarceration. He's incarcerated. But look at what is going on. People are sitting at home on their own, voluntarily, civilly. And you want to ignore that? And you think you can subdue it by what? The only way you can deal with that is to talk about it. My last question for you. Um, still that Thursday, I hear as uh, the supporters wait for court after they may sing, they're happy as everything they go on for court. They still talk, say, that election, November 6th, say they know for who. Why then they talk like that? Well, they still talk, say, they still talk, say, me, I they still the talker. The most important things in this country are not being talked about. Why are we married to elections within a system that is so dysfunctional that even your elections are highly questionable? That's what I think this kind of seems to be saying. So it goes beyond the election boycott or this mantra of no elections. He's instead saying there are issues that are more important than elections, that need to be addressed first. Why this obsession with the elections, within a system that is so sick, so dysfunctional, that when you deal with these issues first, elections will come naturally without any let or hindrance.